السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد Last time we finished ayah number 35 in Surah Muhammad Okay. Surah Muhammad is Surah number 47 and today we are going to start with ayah number 36 which is three ayat away from the the finish line after the ayat that we explained before give us uh, an image and a picture of how the relationship of the disbelievers were with the Prophet ﷺ and the instructions that Allah has given the Prophet ﷺ and the believers telling them in Ayah 35 do not weaken do not underestimate where you are and invite for a peace truce while you are having the upper hand and Allah is with you and Allah will not change your works which means Allah will not waste your efforts in ayah number 36 it comes up with a prospective statement. It says that this life, this life of this worldly living that we are in is no more than a game or a play and an entertainment. It's just time wasted. You know, when you have nothing to do and you just spend time doing whatever, this is in Arabic called lahu. Lahu means useless activity. Describing it as a play is entrenched in the Quran that this life is a play. Even though that in Surat Al An'am, Surah number 6 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, do the people of the towns feel so secure so much so that they believe we will not punish them at the forenoon time while they are playing You know that the forenoon is the business time. It is between like 7.30 in the morning until 12. That range, okay? This is the heat of the business time. People who are going to the farm are in their farm. People who are going to the factory are in their factory. People who work in a school are in their school and so on and so forth. So this is the busiest time and supposedly to be the most productive time in the day. And the ayah of Surah Al-An'am is saying, do the people of the village feel too secure for our punishment to come unto them while they are playing during the noon time? The pre-noon time, I'm sorry, pre-noon time. So the ayah is clearly calling our most serious business productive time of the day it is calling it play this is when we make money this is when we harvest and sow and plant cultivate and hold meetings and sign contracts and 
hear court cases and conduct business, Allah's calling it play. Why would the Quran call it play? It is in contrast to the hereafter, it's a play. In comparison to the hereafter, because this whole life compared to the hereafter, when it comes to value, this compares to zero versus infinity. And as you, Sister Muna, blew into your hand for the zero, this is exactly what Allah says, the works of the people who do not believe in the hereafter will become blown away into thin air. That's exactly what the zero is in a sign language. So the ayah is telling us that this worldly life is nothing but a play and a useless type of activity. The only thing that matters in this life is whatever produces a credit with Allah in the hereafter. And I want everybody to think about this and ponder. Take a minute and think about it. Do we really live this life for the sake of the hereafter? Do we set our priorities based on the fact that this life is only a play? Or do we give it so much value that we would not want this life to go away without us accumulating as much profit, as much uh, money, as much bank accounts and credit and credit cards, the biggest house, the biggest car, all of this. So the ayah comes to tell us that this life is not worth it compared to the hereafter. This doesn't mean that it equals real zero, but even if it does, which is in contrast to the hereafter, it does equal zero. But listen to what's coming. Zero is useless by itself, but when you put one next to it, it is 10. When you put another zero, it equals 100. So zero is worthless by itself, which means this life by itself is worth nothing. But whatever connects our work in this life to the hereafter is what gives this life meaning and value. So this is what the ayah is referring to. Then it goes on to say, and if you believe, and if you are mindful of Allah, and you are considerate of his presence in your life, then Allah will give you your rewards and will not ask you for your wealth or your money. What does this mean? It means that if you believe in Allah, if you are respectful and appreciative of Allah, Allah will give you your rewards and your wages, is the word used in Arabic, and will not ask you your money. Does this mean that Allah is asking us to pay zakah and charity because we are not believers or because we are not mindful of him? No. It says this means that if you believe and you are mindful of Allah, which means you believe in Allah and in the hereafter, what you do is not going to be wasted.
Then ayah number 37, it says, if he asks you and you act as a stingy creature, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would actually uh, expose your disgusts. He will expose your shortcomings. He will show you that what you're doing is actually against your interest. It will expose your weaknesses and it will expose your grudges. Then the last ayah, ayah number 38, here you are invited to spend in the path of Allah. Some of you will act miserly. And whoever behaves miserly, he is exercising miserly against his own interest, against himself. And Allah is the one without needs. And you are the poor, needy ones. And if you turn away, he would replace you with a community other than yourself. And they, will not be, they would not be like you, which means they will not be stingy. They will not be bad. They will not be uh, behaving in the same way. So here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us that we must use the blessings he has given us for our own interest by not piling everything for this life, but really working for the credit of the hereafter. And the less you put in that credit for the hereafter, your miserly behavior is going to work against you. You will come as a bankrupt person on the day of judgment. This is what the ayah is referring to. So when Allah invites us to spend in his path, he is giving us an opportunity to put something in the saving credit box for our next life. And it will not decrease your wealth in this life. Because in other places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that whatever you spend in the path of Allah, Allah certainly would replenish it for you and would bless for you all what you keep to yourself and your family. So the way for blessings is not to pile up money and wealth for yourself. The way to blessings is to spend in the path of Allah because the money you make is a provision from Allah. So don't be stingy, be generous and Accept the fact that it, this wealth is a gift from Allah that he could have given your neighbor and not you. So when he gives you, look after your neighbor. Look after your brother and sister who may be needy and do not keep it to yourself. Allah who provided you in the past will continue to provide you tomorrow, after tomorrow, until you die. So don't be stingy. This ayah number 38 will conclude surah number 47, named Surah Muhammad. If anyone has a question about any specific ayah, Point the ayah for me and we can go back and explain what you missed or what you want to ask about.
If there is no question, we can definitely move on to the following surah, surah Al-Fatha, A-L-F-A-T-H. A L F A T dot H Al Fatah. Any question? Okay. We can go on for Surat Al Fatah. Surat Al Fatah. came down to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the Mushrikeen of Mecca, the polytheists of Mecca, the pagans, idol worshippers, broke a truce with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They broke a truce agreement by attacking the allying tribes who allied themselves with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it came down to give the Prophet the good news that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is giving him the great conquest of Mecca. They were living in Medina, of course, and the majority of them were still uh, freshly coming back coming from Mecca and they were anxious to get back to Mecca because a year before they tried to go and make Umrah in Mecca but the pagans stopped them at the outskirts of Mecca and they had a truce between the two of sides and they told them now you go back to Medina without Umrah and without fight But if you insist, we can fight you back. Otherwise, you can come next year and we will not oppose you and you can come in peacefully. So the following year, the Prophet وسلم, got the news that they attacked his supporters uh, a tribe called Khuza'a, K-H-U-Z-A-A-H, Khuza'a. So the Prophet وسلم, was told in the Quran to throw in their face the, the truce agreement and to tell them it is finished. In any way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the upper hand and he went into Mecca with 10,000 armed men. They brought their arms with them. Everybody was armed and ready to fight if the pagans were to stop them. So here's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counting those events for us. So in the beginning of the surah, it says, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. Certainly, we have given you a clear victory, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that Allah may forgive you of your previous and subsequent faults. and may complete his favor upon you and may guide you to a straight path. We know that prophets and messengers hold the highest esteemed status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the purest of his creation They are chosen deliberately by Allah from amongst all of us humans to become 
both humans, but at the same time, exemplary models for all humans. So when Allah speaks about forgiving your sin, it doesn't mean that Prophet Muhammad was what is called in Christianity sinful. Because the word sinful refers to a person whose habit is to sin. But the fact that Allah is saying that he would forgive you your sin, it means that it is something so minor that even you know, the statement of forgiveness is given by Allah as easy as the statement says. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving Prophet Muhammad that not only are you given victory, but you are also given forgiveness for your previous sin and whatever sin that you will do later on. I want to remind everybody that because the companion Uthman bin Affan, Uthman was a wealthy companion among the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And Uthman would spend almost whatever money Allah gives him, he would invest it and give the profit to the community or he would give it itself to the community. Like he dug a well and that well is still bringing water until today. It's an amazing story. He supplied all materials needed for an entire battle army with all what it takes horses horse covers uh, uh, munition everything so much so that the prophet peace be upon him of course informed by Allah and Uthman ibn Affan uh, was an early companion amongst the early to believe and follow the Prophet ﷺ. Right following Abu Bakr and Umar, uh, Uthman was in that early group of believers. So after he supplied the uh, army for a whole battle, all the army, the Prophet Sallallahu says, there is nothing Uthman would ever do in his life that would blemish his record with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala or will be recorded negatively in his record. Which means Uthman, by this statement, is forgiven everything in the past and everything in the future. So what is the relevance of the story of Uthman to this ayah, ayah number two in Surah Al-Fatih? The relevance is the following. It shows that if Uthman is goodness and generosity, could give him that full-blown amnesty from any accountability or any blemish on his record for life, what about the Prophet ﷺ and his goodness? So it is not strange that the Prophet ﷺ be given such amnesty and such clemency The claim that Jesus 
is divine by the Christians who believe he is. And we discuss this frequently. They say that Muhammad is a human and we have no problem with you saying that, but don't say that Jesus was only a human. He was also divine. And you ask them why? They say because he was sinless and he sacrificed his life for our own sins. Well, it is in the Bible that Jesus was approached by his mother. May Allah bestow his peace upon all of them. And she was calling him and he was preaching and he was engaging the community and stuff and he didn't want to be interrupted. So the Bible claims and I use this word deliberately, that Jesus told her, what do I have to do with you, O woman? Such a language by anyone towards his or her mother, if this is not a sin, then what is a sin? If talking disrespectfully and discounting your mother as a woman is not disrespect, then what is? And if disrespecting a person's mother is not sin, then what is a sin? Besides, Jesus himself denounced the claim that people made that he brought people who are dead to life. He said, on my own power, I can do nothing. On my own power, I can do nothing. He said, nobody knows when is the hour not even the angels, nor does the Son of Man, referring to himself, saying that I do not know when the hour will come. So he denied power, he denied knowledge of the unknown, and those are statements of repelling and refuting the claim that he is divine. So one has to take notes. So the fact that Prophet Muhammad is spoken of in the Quran as a person with a sin, a sin here means mistake. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, every son of Adam, every child of Adam is bound to make mistakes. And the best among those who make mistakes are the ones who repent on regular basis. This is very important to note. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ayah number two, so that Allah would forgive you your previous sins and future sins and to perfect his blessings upon you. And to perfect his blessings upon you and to guide you to a straight path. And then, and so that Allah may support you with a mighty victory. It is he, Allah, and number four, who have sent down 
his tranquility in the hearts of the believers so that they grow more in faith in addition to their existing faith. And to Allah belong the forces of the heavens and the earth. And Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, ayah number four, he is counting his blessings upon the believers, saying it is he who has sent down tranquility in the hearts of the believers to increase them in faith beside their faith level that they already have. And to Allah belongs the soldiers of the heavens and the earth and Allah is the one who is all-knowing, all-wise. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So part of how Allah helps the believers during a fight with the disbelievers, like the one that happened in the battle of Badr and others, is that Allah would put tranquility in the hearts of the believers so that they are not afraid of their enemies, they are not concerned about their life or their family or their wealth. They are focusing on putting a good fight against the aggressors who wanted to exterminate the Muslim community. And Allah, when he puts this tranquility in the hearts of the believers, their heart would be full of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they feel calm. They feel content and happy that Allah has chosen them to give a pushback against the aggressor forces. And to point the fact that tranquility is one of the soldiers that Allah deploys in the hearts of the believers during their fight against aggressing forces, Allah says, and to Allah belongs the forces and the soldiers and the powers in the heavens and in the earth. And Allah is the all-knowing, all-wise. Ayah number five. It says, so that he admits believing men and believing women to the gardens beneath which rivers flow to live therein forever and so that he may write off their evil deeds which is a great achievement in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here we have it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he gave the victory to the believers by giving them tranquility in their heart and by increasing their faith in their heart so that he may admit them, the believers, men and women, into paradise under which rivers run to live therein forever. This is eternal bliss. This is not something temporary. It is eternal blessings by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only that, but also he says, so that he may write of their evil deeds. In a statement, in this ayah, it points to the fact that we humans, even the best of believers will commit wrongdoing because we have that wicked side to our souls. Every human being has that. Every human being has a companion from the devils to tempt us, to persuade us, and to make us slip into disobedience. 
We have a tongue that is difficult to control. We have hands that are pushed by our impulses. All of these are evil deeds. And Allah is saying, even the believers who are entered into paradise, they have sins to be forgiven. What an amazing statement that should prompt every one of us to be very humble. To humble ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then ayah number six. And so that he may punish the hypocrites, men and women, and the polytheists, men and women, who think evil thoughts about Allah. What an amazing statement. They must have a vicious circle and Allah has become angry with them and he has prepared hellfire for them. And what an evil destination. What an evil abode. So, ayah number five talks about the reward of the believers. Ayah number six talks about the punishment of both the hypocrites and the polytheists, the idol worshippers, men and women. who think evil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the reward of the believers and the punishment for the disbelievers and the hypocrites to warn us not to behave like them, not to think like them. They are thinking evil of Allah because they do not believe in him. But we Muslims should trust Allah and should think and expect the best from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even at our worst times. And those of us who are following the news coming out of Gaza, you would see people coming from underneath the rubble of their own homes with dust still over their head and faces and they are raising their hands saying alhamdulillah we're grateful to allah despite the fact that they just have come from underneath the rubble and their children and the rest of their families are still under the rubble and they are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is a huge gift of tranquility in their hearts that Allah must have put there to give them this contentment and gratitude expression they are grateful to Allah whatever happens and they say, if this is the price for independence of our land and country and people, be it. If this is what Allah determines to happen, we accept it with gratitude. They lose five, six, seven, ten children, and they are saying, Alhamdulillah. So, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number four, that it is he who has put tranquility in the hearts of the believers to increase them in faith. And he shows us this on display with our own eyes coming to us almost life as those believers are coming from underneath the rubble 
and the dust is still covering their eyes and heads and mouth and nose. And they are raising their hands with gratitude and appreciation to Allah. May Allah give us all that level of faith, that level of confidence and trust in Allah and in His wisdom. And may Allah save us from the fate of the hypocrites and the disbelievers that he mentioned in ayah number six. Again, in ayah number seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats what he mentioned above in ayah number four. He says, and to Allah belongs the soldiers and the forces of the heavens and the earth. And Allah is the mighty and wise one. We'll stop at ayah number seven so that I may go to my next appointment. And next time, inshallah, it will be ayah number eight. So I hope that we all benefit from this class. I ask Allah to accept all of our effort and I urge you to please make this message of Allah known to your family and your friends. Invite them to attend or at least give them the recording. Thank you, Sister Muna. Thank you, Sister Andalib. And thank you all for coming back to this class. May Allah bless you and bless your family. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.